My talk tonight is the relative risk of abortion versus childbirth, focusing on both psychological morbidity and mortality. The questions that we'll address tonight are what risk factors for both post-abortion mental health problems are the most well established in the professional literatures? What specific negative psychological outcomes have the most empirical support in the world literatures? And is there evidence that childbirth is psychologically safer than abortion? So looking first at the world literature on abortion and women's mental health, um, it has grown exponentially in the last 30 years or so, uh, and the rigor of the studies has increased dramatically. So we have a, you know, an enormous literature out there on this topic. Unfortunately, it doesn't get out to the public very easily, um, but there are many, many peer-reviewed journal articles that address both the risk factors for psychological problems and the outcomes, and so we're going to look at both sides here. A recent literature search for articles published between 1972 and 2011 yielded over 100 studies documenting variables that increase the risk of women experiencing post-abortion mental health problems. First, being pressured or coerced by others to abort, and sometimes it's more subtle pressure. It may just be feeling like the partner doesn't want to have the baby, or um, there can be pressure um, that relates to circumstances, but um, most of it, the studies out there identify fairly significant pressure from the partner, and there are at least nine out um, available. If she's religious or views an abortion to be in conflict with her personal values, there are 10 studies. The pregnant woman was ambivalent about the abortion, experienced decision difficulty, or had a high degree of decisional distress, 21 studies. She was committed to the pregnancy, or she preferred to carry the child to term, seven studies. Belief that abortion terminates the life of a human being and or the woman experienced bonding to the fetus, six studies. And actually, uh, research indicates that about fi up to 50% of women who terminate a pregnancy believe that they are killing a human life. They, they have that understanding, and yet they often, um, you know, it's a crisis situation. They're often feeling pressured to make the decision, and they often come to the conclusion that it's my life versus this baby's life. So it's almost like a self-defense reaction. Uh, but I think, you know, a lot of people think that women who have abortions don't believe that they're killing a human being, but most do, or at least half. Uh, she had pre-abortion mental health or psychiatric problems, 31 studies. And that's an important risk factor, uh, partly because people on the pro-choice side of things, whether you're talking about researchers or other professionals, um, they tend to dismiss the psychological impact of abortion by saying, you know, it's just women who had prior mental health problems. They were, de they were depressed before, they were anxious before, so of course they're going to be afterwards. But one of the things we've tried to do in recent years is control for prior psych history and try to tease out that independent effect of abortion. And there are many studies now where we've done that. But we also don't want to forget that women who do have this prior psych history, a pre-existing mental health problem, are more at risk. And so they should be identified uh, prior to that decision, and they should be helped more. And, you know, they're, they're, they are an at-risk population. And we know that abortion clinics don't spend much time counseling, and they're very unlikely to identify someone who has a prior history. Uh, the pregnant woman was an adolescent or young adult, 15 studies, also more at risk. Oftentimes it's not their decision, or they may hide the pregnancy, and it may end up being more of a late-term pregnancy, and there's more risk psychologically with that. Um, but a lot of pressure among young adults. She was in a conflicted, unsupportive relationship with the father of the child, 24 studies. The pregnant woman experienced negative relationships with other people in her life, 28 studies. 
character traits suggesting emotional immaturity, instability, or difficulties coping were present, 42 studies. Um, indicators of poor quality abortion care, feeling misinformed, inadequate counseling, negative perceptions of staff, et cetera, 10 studies. Many of the risk factors are complexly interconnected. Um, so we've just gone through several, and oftentimes in the case of any individual woman, many of these are operative. Um, and this testimony exemplifies this. The title of this story, of this uh, woman's story, it was Every Day Hurts. It was posted by a woman by the name of Claire, and I just happened to find this online. It's on a site called the Experience Project, where people from all walks of life um, connect and support each other through stories. So it's not a site that's specific to abortion, but I did find several stories related to this topic. So she said, I found out I was pregnant at 23 in February 2011. I was in a stable, happy relationship with a good job. I was so excited. I told my friends and partner, who were also thrilled. My mom found out and started talking about finances, work, etc. After my first scan, I went to surprise her with it, with the photo. She tried to hide it and told me to put it away so no one could see. I felt like my baby was unwelcome. I realized how embarrassed she was of me, so I told myself that an abortion was the solution. On the morning of the operation at 12 weeks, the doctor gave me a scan and I Unfortun and unfortunately, I saw the screen, which is the image, now stuck in my head every day. For the past year, I've cried every day and find it difficult to look at a baby or a pregnant woman without my eyes filling up. It feels like my stomach twists and something hurts inside. As for the really crazy part, I did a pregnancy test every week after the abortion for nearly eight months in hopes it would be positive, even though I knew it was impossible. If nothing else, I hope this makes others who have, ha who have had an abortion realize that they're not on their own. And to those thinking about it, I would say if there's a part of you that wants to keep the baby, this is not an option. So 40 years of research has shown that when specific physical, psychological, demographic, and situational factors are operative in women's lives, they are at a significantly increased risk of experiencing mental health problems following abortion. Even abortion doctors agree on these risk factors. A relatively recent textbook by abortion doctors titled Management of Unintended and Abnormal Pregnancy Comprehensive Abortion Care by Paul and colleagues lists many risk factors in the chapter on counseling, and I'm just going to go through those briefly. Um, so in the abortion text, we see commitment and attachment to the pregnancy, perceived coercion, ambivalence, uh, putting great effort into keeping the abortion a secret for fear of stigma, advanced stage of pregnancy, pre-existing experience of trauma, past or present sexual, physical, or emotional abuse, unresolved past losses, and perception of abortion as a loss, fetal abnormality or other medical indicators for abortion, intense guilt and shame before the abortion, an existing emotional disorder or mental illness prior to the abortion, appraisal of abortion as extremely stressful before it occurs, expecting depression, severe grief or guilt, and regret after the abortion, belief that abortion is the same act as killing a newborn infant, lack of emotional support, and receiving criticism from significant people in their lives. So a very extensive, exhaustive list of these risk factors. And then the American Psychological Association, you know, they'll debate that abortion is a, a, tra a, a trauma trigger for people generally, but they will, they, in their report that was released in 2008, um, and I had the unfortunate experience of being one of their reviewers, I uh, received the document about a month before my review was due back in 2007, and I was headed to Portugal, and I shouldn't have opened it on the plane. I was afraid I was going to have a heart attack while I was up in the air, but um, it, was, it was an unbelievable representation of the literature. They left out like 60 studies. They had clever ways of selecting and discarding studies so that the conclusion would be what they wanted it to be, politically correct, that an unintended pregnancy um, 
uh, that ends in abortion is not any more stressful, essentially, than one that is carried to term. But, but they, they couldn't get around this literature on risk factors. And so their list of risk factors or, or vulnerable women um, is in that report. And so some of the ones they included, you know, the same themes that I went through in terms of my coverage of those, you know, 40 years of studies and what, and similar to what the abortion doctors acknowledge. So the APA noted a wanted or meaningful pregnancy, pressure from others, opposition to the abortion from partners, family, and or friends, lack of social support, commitment to the pregnancy, ambivalence, um, low perceived ability to cope. So despite the availability of strong research documenting risk factors and professional awareness, abortions, abortion providers rarely, if ever, routinely screen for risk factors and counsel women at risk. And now we'll kind of turn to the other um, big topic in the literature looking at the psychological consequences. And there isn't an abundant literature comprised of methodologically sophisticated studies from around the world that now indicate abortion significantly increases uh, the risk for certain mental health problems. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are the primary ones present in the research, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and suicidal thoughts and behaviors. A minimum, and I think it's very conservative, a minimum of 20% of women who abort suffer serious, prolonged negative psychological consequences. Not just a fleeting depression or anxiety state, but a continuing mental health problem that often goes on for many years. Abortion is further associated with a higher risk for negative psychological outcomes when compared with unintended pregnancy carried to term. And the data indicate that risk for long-term psychological injury is considerably higher with abortion than with other forms of perinatal loss. There's some excellent studies that have come out of Norway by a researcher by the name of Ann Brown, B-R-O-E-N, and she compared women who had a natural loss, of a miscarriage or a stillbirth, and to women who had a voluntary termination. And she saw that initially the, the rates of anxiety and depression were pretty comparable, around 25%. But then the women who had the miscarriages had resolved the loss by two years and five years, whereas the women who had aborted were still si experiencing significant levels of both depression and anxiety, even at five years. Um, post-termination. So abortion-related psychological problems may also increase a person's chance of engaging in self-harm, even if not motivated by suicidal thoughts. Um, and so they do, you know, the idea here is that they just begin to not really care. There's a lot more risk-taking. And that can be in the form of, you know, substance use or driving fast or promiscuity. There's just less self-care that we see. Um, I just, a couple years ago, we launched this large national rep, uh, retrospective study of abortion and mental health, so I thought I would share some of the results here. There are over 200 survey items, and it's, it, it's an in-depth study of how personal experiences surrounding abortion are associated with post-abortion mental health. We've got nearly 1,100 participants now who have completed the surveys. And we have an interesting control group of 121 women, I wish we had more, um, who seriously considered an abortion to the point of actually going to an abortion provider and then changing their mind. So that's about as close of a comparison you can get for a control group. because problem with comparing women who deliver, if it's a wanted pregnancy or, you know, people are married and in a position to have a baby, it's really kind of a different psychological state or even with unintended pregnancy delivered, the woman may not have ever considered an abortion. And so this is kind of like the ideal control group. So it'll be interesting when we look at these comparisons. Um, demographically, the women were quite similar to the general population in the U.S in terms of education, income, and so forth. 67% had one abortion, 19% had two, and 14% had three or more. I think there was one person in the data set that had, had like 12. Um, um, in response, and so I'll just kind of go through some of the items that have relevance to the topic here. Um, in response to the item, I tended to take greater risks after the abortion because my personal safety was less important to me. 
30% of the women strongly agreed, 25% agreed, and among these women, for 77%, that they were still feeling that way or, or behaving that way three years later. In response to the item, I experienced bouts of extreme sadness from the abortion. 58% strongly agreed, 22% agreed, and among these women, for 89%, uh, it lasted three years or more. In response to the item, I felt like part of me died during the abortion. 55% strongly agreed, 24% agreed, and among these women, 91% reported it was continued at least three years. In response to the item, I relied on alcohol and our drugs to escape troubling post-abortion emotions. 27% strongly agreed, 23%, that's 50%, uh, and it lasted for seven, for 72%, it lasted three years or more. In response to the item, life felt like it wasn't worth living because of the abortion. 26% strongly agreed, 19% agreed, and for 68% it persisted for three years or more. With regard to the item, I thought about taking my life because I had the abortion. 20% strongly agreed, 14% agreed. Among these women, for 58% it lasted three years or more. In response to the item, I made realistic attempts to take my life because of the abortion. 8% strongly agreed, 5% agreed. And among these women, for 52%, these suicidal um, you know, attempts um, were going on. And then um, also within this data collection effort, we also have some open-ended questions where women can tell their stories, their, their testimonies. And so when asked what was the hardest part about undergoing an abortion, these were some of the comments we got. The abortionist never spoke a word to me. It was as though we were not even human. The only words I ever heard from him were these. I think that was the biggest one we've ever done. The whole thing was absolutely shocking and painful in so many ways. I had to numb myself after the fact. I tried so hard to pretend it never happened. The father and I made a pact that we would never speak of it again. We kept that pact for 18 years, but the consequences were deadening. Another woman said, I had to shut down my emotions completely. Only a few short years before I longed for and dreamt of being on my own and having a child someone I could love and cherish after all the abusive people in my life. The abortion experience made me believe that I was unworthy of ever having a child. I was overcome by an incredible amount of self-loathing and sank into a deep depression that lasted for years. Almost immediately after the abortion, I developed an infection and secretly wished I would die from it. I was prescribed an antibiotic and I survived. Another woman said, the hardest part is reliving it. I woke up during the procedure, so to this day, I rem on random days, I remember the loud vacuum-like sounds and grotesque sucking pressure on my insides. This memory replays itself in my head over and over again to the point of near vomit. The feeling of loss. I long for my baby, and through the act of abortion, I did something that's completely irreversible. So the strongest studies were published between 1995 and 2009 are synthesized in a reason other, God help me here to get this one published too, um, but that it was published in the British Journal of Psychiatry. It's a meta-analysis. Um, it created a lot of controversy. That's why I had the opportunity to speak in British Parliament about the time that soon after this study came out, um, that the timing was very interesting because the Royal College of Psychiatrists had just um, produced a narrative review of the literature. It was like 280 pages, similar to the American Psychological Association report, only craftier in terms of their, um, you know, dismissal of studies. They dismissed a whole bunch of studies just saying that there wasn't any usable data. So why was it, if, why were these studies in peer-reviewed journals if there wasn't any usable data? But stuff like that it was really ridiculous. And they did open it up to anybody to send reviews. And so it was a little more open than the APA in terms of the semblance of listening to feedback. But um, what was really interesting is the British Journal of Psychiatry 
is affiliated with the Royal College. And so on the one hand, they're producing this narrative document saying that basically the same thing as the APA, that uh, abortion is not associated with any increased risk beyond an unintended pregnancy delivered, same politically correct conclusion, and yet their own journal they, they published my study. They had, a, they had an editor who just had a lot of integrity. I have no idea where he is on the issue, but the science was adequate. And, uh, and they were hit with tons of, artic uh, tons of letters to the editor, criticizing them for publishing it. And then um, there were some supportive comments. <laughs> I got a few there. And then um, they offered me the opportunity to write a rebuttal. So I did that after they had accumulated. But it, it really kind of made a splash because it stands as really the largest study in the world. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. But uh, this is um, basically briefly what a meta-analysis is, if you're not familiar. You're combining the numerical results from many high-quality studies that address the same basic question. So here the question is, is there an association between abortion and mental health? Um, and studies are weighted statistically. So meta-analysis offers a logical and more objective um, way to analyze a broad literature than these narrative reviews. But the professional organizations are sticking to the narrative reviews because if they start quantifying it, they're not going to be able to deny that there's an effect there. So they definitely didn't want this study around. And I, I felt the need to have this study. I, as I'm not somebody who does meta-analyses regularly, but I, I bought the software for 99 bucks and spent a Christmas break doing most of the work for this. And um, um, it wasn't very hard to do. It's not like it's, you know, you need some advanced training to do a meta-analysis. And so there's no excuse for these professional organizations not to have conducted a meta-analysis a long time ago. And, and because those professional organizations carry so much weight and clout, and when you're in court and you're trying to defend bills and so forth, they always bring up the APA or the Royal College, even though those documents were so biased and so policy driven and so I knew we needed something to be able to defend you know the literature better and so this quantitative review has been able to use it pretty effectively when you know testifying for bills that are really in women's best interest and um, so anyway I, I took I found 22 studies that were published during that window and um, combined and the, the overall pooled odds ratio or the combined effect uh, basically indicated that women who had an abortion experienced an 81 percent risk for mental higher risk for mental health problems compared to women who have not had an abortion and this is the data which obviously you can't see but you can see the pattern if abortion were not having a systematic effect on women's mental health then all of those horizontal lines would be hovering around uh, the middle vertical line, but you can see they're shifted to that third quadrant. That's a systematic effect. Those, those are the effects across many studies. And they've tried to find a study that I missed that I didn't include to try to insinuate that I did it in a biased way, but nobody's been able to find one that fit my criteria for inclusion, sample size of at least 100, having control variables, you know, in the it might have been one in another language, but um, I, I, you know, stuck to um, papers published in English. But anyway, um, so it's been useful to have this as a, a reference out there. And then um, looking at the population attributable risk, this was another statistic that I was able to derive from that odds ratio. Basically, what the PAR tells us is that nearly 10% of the incidence of mental health problems are directly attributable to abortion in our society. If abortion were wiped out, you'd have 10% of the female population not affected by mental health problems. So that's kind of dramatic and, and important to know. And then we can look also at the benefits of, of motherhood. So in contrast, there are many established benefits of motherhood. A number of studies have shown positive psychological characteristics, including an increased sense of control, feelings of serenity, self-esteem, empathy, ego resiliency, which is the capacity for flexibility and resourcefulness in coping with stressors, and assertiveness associated with motherhood. According to Ellison, uh, frequent close contact inherent in the daily care of a young child results in expanded maternal brain activity and neural growth. 
so it'll make you smarter to be a mom. Um, <laughs> dumber in some ways, but smarter in others. Um, when comparing 248 British women experiencing a planned pregnancy to 182 women experiencing an unplanned pregnancy, Deve in 2005 found that 87% of the women who planned their pregnancies and 79% of the women who did not reported feeling pleased or overjoyed just prior to delivery. Um, they were all first-time mothers residing in lower <laughs> socioeconomic areas. So this whole issue like of unintended, unplanned, unwanted, it's you know that is a variable that is not like that stays the same somebody may initially not plan a pregnancy or not even want a pregnancy but th by the time they come around to delivering very few are going to say they don't want the baby so um, it's important to keep in mind it's an evolving construct it's not it's not set so if, if women breastfeed um, there are additional benefits as lactation produces the antidepressant chemical oxytocin and studies suggest lactating mothers are less tense and become bored less easily than their non-lactating peers. The hormonal circuitry and neural circuitry associated with childbirth and lactation reduces depression and anxiety. And this is interesting. Carter and Eunice Yunvas Moberg, leading authorities on oxytocin, have provided scientific evidence suggesting that the brain becomes more receptive to to the impact of oxytocin after the first heavy dose during labor and breastfeeding. Um, hormones of pregnancy and early motherhood apparently facilitate the formation of subsequent strong personal relationship bonds. So it, it, it benefits women in terms of the closeness of their relationships to others after having had a birth and having nursed. But what about postpartum depression? We always hear about that. Well, um, the incidence rate of postpartum depression is between 3.4 and 11 percent. However, the form of depression, this form, leads to less is considerably less serious than major depression, which we see with uh, at a rate of 20 percent after abortion. Moreover, postpartum depression is very unlikely to precipitate suicide. <coughs> Childbirth is very clearly protective against suicide. Uh, Gisler and colleagues in 2005 reported the annual suicide rate for women of reproductive age to be 11.3 per 100,000, whereas the rate was only 5.9 per 100,000 in association with birth and was a startling 34.7% per 100,000 following abortion. Several other studies have revealed even lower rates of suicide in the year following birth when compared to non-postpartum samples. In the U.S., the postpartum suicide rate w was found to be only 1.4 per 100,000. Um, and then in the, in the United Kingdom, a very low rate of 0.5 per 100,000 was observed. In England and Wales, in a population-based study, Appleby 91 reported in the British Medical Journal that uh, pregnant women are 120th as likely to commit suicide when compared to non-pregnant women of childbearing age. Appleby concluded motherhood seems to protect against suicide. <laughs>